sector and, and experts that we have in the private sector uh, before we introduce the legislation. So we're working on a breach notification law, but we want to do it right. And we want the input you know, from all of you in the private sector as to how this would best work. I think one of the problems today is when you have a breach, uh, many companies do not report that to, to CISA uh, for a variety of reasons. And it's I understand that, uh, mainly because um, they don't want the vulnerability out there. Uh, they have a risk to their uh, or duty to their shareholders, a fiduciary duty. And so we need to create a, a system where uh, a breach notification system that would uh, protect these companies from that kind of vulnerability, kind of like in the classified space when, when I... Everybody, um, even though I am privileged to call Congressman McCall a, a dear friend for the past 20 years and a former colleague, I still get starstruck when I introduce him, um, even though we went to the same law school and we both got a degree um, from St. Mary's University School of Law. The accomplishments and contribution that Congressman McCall has achieved over his career as a lawyer and leader are could take a full day for me to recite. But today, I'd like to go over a few highlights that set the table for his remarks, um, just to let you know a little about his background. Uh, we met in 2000 when he was the deputy attorney general for then attorney general john cornyn and i was on the same floor and got to know him as a, a thought leader and and a friend uh, but after that it, he has just skyrocketed um he ran for congress for the 10th congressional district of the united states congress and successfully has won for nine terms um, he's currently serving as the Republican leader of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, but prior to that, um, he was a former chairman of the House Committee on Homeland Security. Before uh, term limits became in effect, he served during the 113th, 115th, and 116th con Congresses. Um, one of the highlights of his uh career in that role is that he passed into law and stood up the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency, otherwise known as CISA. Later this afternoon, we will be hearing from one of the CISA advisors that exists because of Congressman McCall's bill. Um, additionally, he passed the Cyber Diplomacy Act out of committee and the list of the bills he has enacted or is responsible for in his career as a congressman is pages long, but I do want to point out he also is responsible for the Emerging or Preventing Emerging Threats Act. And if all of his accomplishments as a leader and, and a pioneer in the area of cybersecurity legislation wasn't enough, he also has a huge heart. And I want to point out Something very special is that Congressman McCall has um, taken a lead in Congress for the cause of childhood cancer. In fact, he founded the Congressional Childhood Cancer Caucus as soon as he was elected. He's had two bills passed that help um, pediatric cancer patients receive drugs faster than they were receiving before his bill. And um, one of his uh, very proud accomplishments is getting the Childhood Cancer Star Act passed where he allowed uh, childhood leukemia survivor Sadie to actually sign the bill um, before the president. So there's not enough wonderful things I could say about this amazing Congressman and we just wanna thank him for allowing us to hear from him today. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Michael McCall. 
No, thank you, Elizabeth. It's great to see your face. And um, I wish I was there in person, uh, but it's great to join uh, all of you virtually as we um, celebrate National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Um, really to discuss, I think, one of the most urgent uh, global threats that the United States uh, faces. And we've seen a lot of that just this year alone. But uh, I, I really appreciate your friendship over the years, Elizabeth, and working uh, together as colleagues under my our dear friend, John Cornyn. And, and um, you know, I, I got really, uh, you know, I was in the um, Department of Justice for a long time and really got interested in, in this new thing called cybersecurity at that time. And I uh, formed a cybersecurity caucus, you know, about 15 years ago when, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't cool at that time to talk about cybersecurity. Uh, but now it's, it, everybody has been discussing it because the threat, threat level has gone up so much. Um, in the last two years, we've seen massive cyber attacks against U.S. companies like SolarWinds um, in Austin, my hometown in Elizabeth, uh, Colonial Pipeline, JBS, software maker, Kaseya, and affecting thousands of people and uh, businesses. And those are just the ones we know about. We know a lot of these ransomware cases are not even reported and uh, they're happening every day. Um, it's, uh, there are several things that I think can be done to serve as an effective defense against many of these attacks. Um, and during my time in Congress, uh, as Elizabeth mentioned, I, I did uh, introduce um, uh, various bills working across the aisle uh, to build an adequate defense system against cyber attacks. Uh, most notably, the passage of CISA, uh, which stood up a structure to better uh, defend the nation against these attacks. At that time, there wasn't, um, we just had what was called the, it was a little bit of a, 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 a three circles on a chart, trying to map out the role of the federal government when it comes to cyber. Uh, obviously, the um, the uh, military, Department of Defense, and the Cyber Command uh, play a huge role in, in the defense of our nation militarily, uh, and they have great offensive capability. I still think the best in, in the world, but um, what we didn't have at that time was a uh, more of a defense system to share threat information across the spectrum, you know, with the private sector. And so that um, there was some debate where, where, where to house that. Uh, some argued that the NSA should have that authorities. That was around the time of Snowden. So um, we eventually agreed that the, the civilian agency at the Department of Homeland Security seemed to be the best fit in place to uh, put this um, this mission, if you will, because it would interact with the private sector um, to um, share threat information, to be able to patch networks against uh, threats. Um, but as cyber attacks become more complex, the US and our allies must also uh, work together. Um, so now as the, the ranking member on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, um, I'm working in terms of on, on the international stage. This is perhaps one of the final pieces uh, to the role of what the federal government can do. One, offensive with our military, standing up in a time of war, uh, DHS uh, on the civilian side with the private sector. And then finally, uh, on the international side. Um, over time, I've seen many attacks from our foreign adversaries and they're con continuing today. The problem is uh, we haven't had any um, really international norms or standards. Uh, so I was, uh, you know, Russia, China, Iran are usually the, the major adversaries that are attacking uh, the United States. Um, China with a lot of espionage. Uh, we shut down the consulate in Houston uh, because they were stealing so much from our Texas Medical Center. Uh, and from NASA. Um, but uh, these adversaries work every day to uh, dismantle um, our national security, compromise it, steal, IP theft. In fact, you've probably heard the reporting about the uh, hypersonic missile that the, that the Chinese launched uh, recently. And unfortunately, that was done in large part with American technology that was either stolen or given to them or sold to them 
by companies in the United States. Um, so what, so in terms of looking on the international side of things, we had uh, passed at a committee, my bill, the Cyber Diplomacy Act. This would be create an ambassador uh, at large uh, with, with an office with authorities to negotiate uh, with other countries, norms and standards, what is acceptable and what is not, and what would be the consequences if it's violated. Uh, obviously, NATO and our allies are the best place to start, you know, with this to counter uh, uh, Russia, China, and Iran. Uh, but Russia, China, and Iran need to also know that if they continue this bad behavior, uh, that there would be, you know, consequences uh, to that. Um, you know, in Geneva, President Biden um, met with Putin, said he had red lines, uh, told him to stop ransomware attacks. Of course, Putin said he had no control over these attacks, but it was interesting uh, how those attacks shut down almost immediately after the meeting, um, which de demonstrates to me that Putin controls all of this. It's like a mafia organization, if you will, a criminal organization with the oligarchs making money off ransomware. And of course, Putin uh, benefits, uh, you know, off that as well, almost like uh, like the godfather of a mafia organization. So while, while he did, he did uh, for a very short period of time, stop these attacks. Unfortunately, they, they ramped them back up in a very strong, strong way. But I think there needs to be a, um, a framework to be created that would implement a response for an attack, certain behaviors that are not acceptable in cyber space uh, on the international uh, side. We don't even have a definition of cyber warfare, for instance. Uh, and I think these attacks should be met with a strong response for deterrence. For instance, uh, I remember when China stole from OPM 23 million security clearances uh, including mine and probably many on this uh, at this conference, and yet there's no there was no um, consequence to that. I know one thing as a former federal prosecutor, if you let bad behavior continue, and as a father too, with my children, if you let bad behavior continue, um, it, without any consequences, it's gonna it's gonna keep going on. So that's why I think this this final piece on the international side of the Cyber Diplomacy Act will help our government work with our allies and partners to better secure cyberspace, but also give it the authorities to hit nations back when a destructive, particularly a destructive attack, when we have a very highly destructive attack to shut things down, like the colonial pipeline, shutting down our energy sector, that that needs to be met with a swift response so they know if they continue to do this, um, we're not going to just sit by, by idly and allow it to go forward. So I think we have to have a clear, coordinated response. Um, also, with our own offensive capabilities as a major uh, deterrent. The um, administration and Congress, I think, it must also collaborate. You know, with the private sector. Uh, the most of the threat information. Uh, a lot of people think that the, the federal government has all the keys to the kingdom, and we have all the threat information, but the majority of the threat information, about 85%, really resides in the private sector. And it's 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 that ability to share uh, information uh, through CISA uh, to help other uh, networks and private, the private sector, you know, patch their networks and create a safer and more secure uh, cyber uh, environment. Um, I think this partnership, it stretches across federal, state and local levels. It's vital to defend against and mitigate against potential risks that uh, cyber attacks have to the public and private sectors. So that's why I think the communication information sharing is key across sectors with the 16 critical infrastructures. Uh, one, another bill that I've been working with Representative Longevin, but we've been trying to make sure the private sector, every time we've done this, we've always wanted to ensure the private sector, we have buy-in from the private sector and, and experts that we have in the private sector uh, before we introduce the legislation. So we're working on a breach notification law, but we want to do it right. And we want the input, you know, from all of you in the private sector as to how this would best work. I think one of the problems today is when you have a breach, 
Uh, many companies do not report that to, to CISA uh, for a variety of reasons. And it's, it, I understand that uh, mainly because um, they don't want the vulnerability out there. Uh, they have a risk to their uh, or duty to their shareholders, a fiduciary duty. And so we need to create a, a system where uh, a breach notification system that would uh, protect these companies from that kind of vulnerability, kind of like in the classified space, when, when I get classified information, we're able to scrub the sources and methods and names and really just get the threat information itself. Um, well, the same thing would happen here, where we'd have a, a, a breach notification system where private sector would 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 notify, but then CISA would scrub the company's name, scrub any sources and methods. And basically all we really care about are the ones in the, in the zeros. You know, what what is the, the code, the malicious code that breached, you know, that got into the networks and caused so many problems. Um, this would be a major step forward, I think, in enhancing CISA's ability and the federal government's ability to protect on a wide spectrum uh, you know, uh, many uh, companies and Amer American citizens and businesses throughout uh, the United States. Um, finally, one of uh, our greatest defenses against cyber attack attacks is education. And that, that's why I think uh, the Cyber Security Awareness Month is so important. Uh, Americans are on the front lines of our cyber defense and as the world becomes increasingly more digital, uh, it's more important than ever that people are educated on the techniques that criminals and and foreign adversaries use uh, and how these attacks, uh, what effects they could have on their daily lives. You know, I know it's not a sexy topic, but, you know, hygiene is always a very important issue as well. I mean, I don't know how many people put their password on a yellow sticky pad right by their computer. I've seen, I, I've seen many members of Congress do that you know, as well. But I think that's a very important uh, piece. Um, we also did a, a, a scholarship for service program that if you uh, served in, in our, with the federal government, either Department of Homeland Security or, or with uh, say our Air Force, uh, that we will pay for your education. We've had a lot of people in, involved in that program uh, as well. So I think knowing how to defend against ransomware, phishing attempts, other, techniques can help protect uh, everywhere, uh, everyone here in the United States. And not to get in the classified space, I'm going to, I know my time is, has expired, as we say, and I'll be prepared to yield back, but I, I've never uh, seen the cyber threat as, as high as it is today. Um, not just from, you know, criminals, but from foreign nation adversary states. Uh, very much a big concern for us in our national security as they steal, um, you know, blueprints from our military to, you know, uh, all of this uh, technology transfer uh, and, and just all the recent attacks that we've all seen just happened this year alone. And I think, again, if we, uh, we get the offensive capability, defensive, but also international and ability to strike back when, when necessary and appropriate, uh, I think would better protect us all. And so with that, thanks for having me today. Uh, I wish I was there in Houston with you, um, but I hope that was of some some benefit. Congressman McCall, I'm, I'm Phil Beckett. I'm sorry, Elizabeth had to had to run. Um, <laughs> so, so you get me, but it's great. <laughs> and thank you so much for being here. I wish you could be here in person. No, I, hopefully next time and uh, we can actually do that. I think also, you know, your perspective, your work at the national, international level is so valuable in informing this group where we're working at the local business level, you know, the local community level, but it has to be in sync with the, the work that you're doing. Um, I had one brief question for you, you know, but you know, a conversation that came up this morning, earlier this morning was around ransomware and should we should we pay it or not? And you, and you, you, you alluded to some of this as well around um, how do we encourage bad behavior or stop bad behavior. I would love to get your thoughts on that before we close out. Good question. I mean, you know, most companies will pay it, right? Because you're held hostage. And, but what I thought, if, if anything, if, if the Clono pipeline case is instructive here because, you know, they notified the FBI and, um, 
the FBI is getting better at it because, uh, as you know, they, they do the ransomware through the Bitcoin process. And I know in the Colonial Pipeline case, we were actually uh, able to get back. I forgot the percentage, maybe 50 yeah, percent right. of what was paid out. And I think as as we crack that code on Bitcoin, we take away, I think, a powerful tool that the uh, attacker has in, a, in, in terms of being able to get that, uh, you know, that that uh, ransomware money is being paid back. So I think that uh, in addition to uh, the, the threat that the United States may, act, because it's one thing to point out, it's not legal for a private company to to fire back. And I've talked to a lot of them that would very much like to, <laughs> but they're prohibited under federal law. And it'd be kind of like the wild west if we opened up every company to, to firing, you know, bullets through cyberspace. So it has to be done in a coordinated way. But I think I think that threat that we are going to retaliate would it would also have a, a very strong impact on that as well. Yeah, no, I, that's great. Congressman Call, I'm sorry we only had a short time. And uh, we, yeah, we'd love to have back in person. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. And I appreciate uh, uh, everybody that's in this field. It's There's no shortage of business. And it's going to continue to be a, a major, um, you know, problem moving forward but we are finding solutions too and that's good that's great we're in with you together thank you thank, thank you, you so, so much. much thank you all right bye-bye